Okay, I think we are going to get started here just to stay on track. So welcome everybody to the Corteva Roundtable, Sustainability, Flexibility and Profitability in Canola. I'm going to pass it over to Debbie now to introduce them and get this roundtable going. Thanks, Caitlin. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Debbie Stiles. I'm the Canola Product Manager for Corteva AgriScience. I've been in this role now for eight years and uh, love canola and I'm really excited that uh, you folks uh, all joined us today to uh, hear from our lead uh, canola breeding leader in North America for Corteva, Chad Kosilny. Uh, he's been with the company for two, since 2000 and he has a PhD in uh, plant breeding. Uh, what, what we're going to be discussing today is Corteva's perspective on integrated pest management as it relates to clubber resistance management, black leg, sclerotinia, uh, harvest management from our harvest max trait, um, and many more other things. So please, uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat, write them in the chat, and I'll be watching that uh, chat box. And when Chad has a break in his uh, presentation, then we'll be addressing some questions as we go through uh, each separate section. And with that, I'll pass it over to Chad. Thanks, Debbie. That screen's up. So as Debbie mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about Corteva's canola breeding um, with majority of the talk will be on club root technology, but I'm also gonna to touch briefly on a number of the other traits because I think they're, they're important to mention as well. Uh, just a little bit more introduction to myself. Um, is, uh, I work in Carmen, Manitoba currently, live in Miami, Manitoba, and have I grew up in Cardale, Manitoba. So I've been in, moved around Manitoba a little bit, but, uh, but Manitoba is, is the province I call home. Debbie mentioned, I go to the university, went to the University of Manitoba for my degrees. Spend a lot of time curling in the winter times when we were allowed uh, back uh, the pre-COVID days. Uh, I've spent a couple of decades wandering canola plots across Western Canada, uh, and was actually uh, interesting. Was looking at plots this past uh, this past summer once we were uh, allowed to sneak into Saskatchewan after uh, the borders opened up a little, and actually got my first trip through Esther Hazy, Saskatchewan this this year, which is kind of surprising. I've avoided that town for this many years. I also enjoy running. Um, that picture is me after being awake for 27 hours and finishing my, my first 100 mile race last summer. And the, the picture on the right is of my family, my four kids and my wife um, that I spend uh, a lot of time with these days when we're locked up in the house together. So, And maybe a brief introduction to Corteva as well, given uh, the company name is relatively new. This was a present, this was a slide I, I got given by another scientist in Corteva and it's, it's soybeans and corn focused, but I think it really tells the story of you know, all the different companies that have uh, kind of came together into DuPont and Dow in, the, in uh, prior to the merger of Dow and DuPont and then Corteva is the spin out of the, the ag divisions of those two companies. Uh, and from my perspective, living through that, uh, that merger and spin out, what it really is is kind of the coming together of people from two different organizations where we get to create our own best in class ag, re ag company and really solve problems for growers. That's really the goal. Um, and it's kind of neat being able to form a new company. And again, I like to start before we get drilling into Western Canada, I like to back out a little bit and just give people some context on rapeseed world production. Uh, we're not alone in our production of rapeseed. We produce more specifically canola in Western Canada, but a lot of the commodity is, is moved around the world. And so you can see North America is about the same size in terms of the geography uh, of production as the U Europe, the Ukraine, and Russia. 
Um, although the Europe is predominantly winter canola, which is seeded in the fall, harvested in the following summer, uh, unlike North America, which is exclusively uh, spring. India, again, uh, it's got a lot, of, uh, a lot of acres in India, but they're planted to Brassica gensia, which is a relative to our, our canola. It's got high glucosinolates and it's domestic use only, so it doesn't really compete with canola on the, on the global scale. And just some trends from last year, uh, there was lower yields in Europe and they had fewer plantings uh, last fall, given weather issues in the fall, things were very dry, and some regulatory challenges around neonics. Chad, um, it, it, we're having some problems with the, uh, with the audio. So if you could okay. just hold up for one second. Sure. Yeah, you may want to, uh, to try um, to, to mute then unmute. Myself or? Yeah, you yeah. Okay. All right, are people hearing me now? Yeah, it's it's very a uh, temporary uh, problem. It doesn't happen all the time, so anyway. Let's oh, see. okay, it comes and goes, fades in and fades out, does it? I'm, I'm seeing in the chat uh, that one person said that he can hear just fine. So okay. I suggest maybe we keep on going. Uh, uh, people, everyone attendees, if you could just put on the chat uh, to all if, if you are not hearing us, that would be really good and we can uh, slow it down or try something different. Yep, I'll speak up a little bit more too. So if it does get faint, they can still hear. And so where was that? Yeah, regulatory issues with no neonics being used in Europe, China, getting that crop established uh, given the seed treatment limitations. Um, so that was a challenge last year. Uh, Ukraine and Russia, they are actually increasing the plantings to spring areas. So that's going to be one, one competitiveness uh, in terms of uh, increasing spring canola area uh, around the globe. Australia last year was very dry, but uh, this year they they planted now they have a lot much better conditions uh, crop looks uh, better in Australia they plant in May which is their fall har it flowers in their spring which is our our fall and harvest midsummer so that crop actually looks looks fairly good right now compared to 2019 and China trying to get information out of China is a little challenging at times so uh, it's flat to lower, given the information I, I know, but uh, it's fairly limited. That's limited information. So. Now to drill into uh, more Western Canada or our Canadian canola breeding programs. We are located, our head office for our, our global head office is actually located in Georgetown, Ontario, which is just outside of Mississauga. Uh, that's where our technology hub is, is done. That's where a lot of our trait integration work done, our double haploids and, and a number of other research activities um, for our global canola efforts are done out of. And then moving to Western Canada, I'm located in Carmen, Manitoba. You can see in the bottom of the screen. And then we have research facilities and breeding facilities in Saskatoon and just outside of Edmonton uh, as well. So and the, the blue dot in southern Alberta, is a, a lot of our production is done down in Lethbridge. So the purpose for today, Debbie kind of touched on it, right, is, is to make sure that uh, this is kind of our, my, my overarching, overarching goals for us in, in Canada is to breed for industry sustainability and profitability uh, by reducing risk, increasing value, and simplifying management for growers. And so that increasing value is, is an important one. We want to be able to increase value on every acre uh, that we are on. And when going, uh, when I was preparing this, I came across the Canola Council of Canada targets and thought that it really outlines quite well uh, a number of the different research efforts that we are undertaking at Corteva. And you can see they outlined, I just maybe make that. You can see their average yields uh, back in 2011, 2013, uh, our, our average yields across Western Canada were 34 bushels. 
It's increased dramatically uh, to 41 bushels from 2016 to 2018. And the Canola Council targets are 52 bushels. So how are we gonna get there? And they outline a number of different aspects by which we can get there, including harvest management, uh, integrated pest management, fertility management, plant establishment, uh, and finally, genetic improvements. And I'm gonna touch uh, on every one of these, some more briefly than others, uh, but this is kind of the outline of what I'm gonna cover. And starting, so club root, like I said, I'm gonna focus predominantly on club root for the first half of this. And across the top are the provincial club root maps. And I would, uh, if people haven't gone and looked at these, I would encourage you to. Um, club root was found in the early 2000s in uh, and around that Edmonton region but it has been spreading across Western Canada. It started spreading out from that area and it's spreading across Saskatchewan and has been found in a number of locations in Manitoba as well. Uh, given its uh, longevity in the soil and it's a soil borne disease, it is going to continue to spread. Um, it, there's, there's you know, very little, we can do mitigation efforts, but water moves, soil moves and uh, we will end up having this spread across across Western Canada. So the next step then was we identified this disease early on and we're actually the first company to deploy a club root resistant hybrid to the marketplace. And that product I have listed in the bottom here was 45H29 deployed in 2009. So 11 years ago, the first club root resistant product was deployed in, in Western Canada. And since then, uh, we have launched uh, 45 CS40 was one, that's a club root sclerotinia stack. Uh, the Brevant seeds, so our Nexera, uh, Omega-9 Healthy Oils, uh, launched 2022 CL, uh, was the first uh, healthy oil launch of a club root resistant product. 45 CM39 and Brevant 3010M have been more recent launches. And those are differential club root gene sources. So we have multiple uh, resistance mechanisms to this disease as well that I'm gonna to touch on briefly as well. First question we see, we maybe see it a little less often um, now, which is a good thing, but I, I heard this question quite a bit, especially at the beginning of last fall, the beginning of sales season, was should I deploy resistance even if I have not seen club root on my farm? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. And I actually, uh, last uh, meeting I was at, or last conference I was at when we were allowed to get together in person, I actually picked up a, a uh, Canola Council of Canada all about club root brochure as well. And they say the exact same thing in there, is that deploying club root resistance early on all your acres is one of the best mitigation things you can do on your farm. And so we need to get to a point where uh, every acre in Western Canada has club root resistant genetics on it, and that'll just minimize its uh, ability to spread uh, and establish across Western Canada. And one of the next questions we often get is why does resistance break down? And this was, uh, I learned a lot more about this last fall from a number of different club root experts in the industry. And these graphics kind of can show that. So CR1, um, so if we say 45H29 was our first deployment of club root resistant genetics. And it was resistant to the predominant pathotype 3H. And so that was the one that was identified early as being the one that was infecting canola and causing the issue. After a, couple, after a number of years though, they did realize that there were other pathotypes in the soil at very low levels. And so what happens is as you grow one source of resistance that is maybe it's resistant to 3H in the soil in this example, and the 3A, every time you grow that resistance source, it minimizes the ability of 3H to infect, which is a great thing doing its job but it isn't able to stop the pathotype 3A to infect. And over time, 3A goes from being very, a very minor pathotype in that soil at very low levels to starting to increase over time. And so you end up with a shift in pathotypes in the soil. And so I have this, if, 
and it can happen relatively quickly. If you're growing canola on canola on canola and using the same club root resistant genetics, it can happen quite quickly, as you see in this graphic. If you're a one in three rotation, this is going to take nine years, which is, which is a better scenario. Um, and so, and then following some of the other mitigation, uh, if we get into rotations and making sure that we keep spore loads low, it might even be longer. So these are the pieces we need to, uh, to just really understand uh, to try to minimize the shifting and the, the movement of these pathotypes uh, so that we can get a better understanding. Because time is our friend. The more time we have to understand this, uh, the more time we have to respond as, as research organizations and seed developers, uh, as well as you know, just making sure that we're, we're being good stewards of the, uh, the traits that are deployed. So when should I rotate sources? This is another question that comes up. And it comes up mostly if you get into that Edmonton region or in areas where 3A has been identified. So in, in areas where, um, so our answer to this is, if you have had club root on your farm or your neighbor has had club root on their farm or it's right in the area, you've been growing club root resistant genetics for the last number of cycles in your canola, it's a question you're going to want to start asking. Uh, and it, you're going to want to start talking to people and we're maybe potentially rotating away from that source of resistance, if you can, would be the goal. That would be when I would suggest people start to rotate sources. Uh, however, we still have, last time, uh, the last survey I looked at, which is maybe a couple of years old now, we still weren't even at 60% of the acres having club root resistant genetics on them at all. And so we have a long ways to go um, to make sure that we get uh, at a minimum any type of club root resistance on those acres. Because 3H, as I mentioned earlier, still is the predominant pathotype across Western Canada. And all of those uh, initial deployment of products, uh, which would include 45 CS40 and a number of other ones, would uh, protect against that predominant pathotype. So again, if you have club root in your area, um, you've been growing club root resistant genetics for the past, in the past, it's a conversation you're going to want to start to have with, the, with your seed, wherever you're purchasing your seed from. Other management recommendations, rotation, right? One in three is key. Uh, like I said, you go from, you know, three years to nine years, that's a, that's a big, big jump. And I know, you know, I, I create new canola products. I like to see as much, many canola acres. I like to see the yellow across Western Canada, but it's at the same time we need to do it sustainably. I wanna be uh, continuing to do research on canola for another couple of decades, so. And controlling volunteers and host weeds quickly. Uh, Club root's been shown to infect, begin infecting plants as uh, early as five weeks, with galls being found at nine weeks. So we need to be ensure uh, on those non-canola years that we are controlling host weeds and, uh, and volunteers very quickly. Patch management. I know this one is, is a little bit more out there. It's a little more awkward. But if you do find a patch on your farm, and you haven't noticed any other areas, and it is maybe in a corner or off to a side or around an approach, it may be worth you know, seeding a perennial, doing treating that patch somewhat differently to minimize the spread. Um, because I know one of the other recommendations that's often talked about that I don't have listed here is to, to clean equipment between every field. And I know that's, uh, I know the challenges around that, and that, that's why I don't have it listed, because to be able to to clean that uh, equipment between every field and the workload involved in that is, is uh, quite onerous. And so patch management is a, is a potential option. And manage spore load. And so it's one of those things that given it's a soil borne disease and you can't see it, um, it's kind of, it, it's easier to ignore. Um, but if you think of it, uh, if you just start to think of it abstractly in terms of similar to say a wild oat issue and resistance in wild oats, uh, you wouldn't wait to take a, 
a proactive stance to a few resistant wild oats uh, until you had a whole bunch of them in the field. You'd want to take a proactive approach once you knew you had some. And so, or maybe even before you get any to, to stop the development uh, of wild oat resistance. And so club roots the same, right? We want to keep those spore loads very low. And so managing spore load. So this is another strategy that we have as a company and we're committed to providing genetics that are resistant to glyphosate, glufosinate, and amazomox, all three herbicide systems. And we're keeping them all distinct and separate. And the goal is with these, that way when you go, you're one in three rotation and maybe you grew a Liberty Link product in the past, you could switch over three years later and grow a Clearfield product. That way you can control any volunteers and make sure that you are uh, you know, extending that rotation. Um, especially if you get into scenarios where you are starting to rotate club root resistant genetics, or if you've grown a non-club root resistant product in the past and you wanna control those susceptible volunteers. So that's a, that's a key piece is, is herbicide rotation as well. And as a company, we have, we do this through a trait integration effort where all our products coming through our pipeline don't have the trait. We still go out and spray uh, the Lontrell and Muster and Assure or Post on our cocktail on our plots to make sure that uh, we can control the weeds. And it's once we get to the uh, right close to the commercial release, as we get closer to the commercial release and we're more confident in these products, then we start to look at them with the uh, herbicide trait in them. And so that's a key piece to this. And I'd be remiss to not talk about our other crop protection uh, products as well. Uh, I'm sure there's many people out there more familiar with a lot of these than myself. Um, but Prospect is a pre-emerge, control those weeds early. Uh, when growing cereals, I know Corteva has a number of different options of cereal herbicides and broad root herbicides. Sortan and corn down around Carmen, obviously growing, uh, keeping corn, uh, keeping canola out of that. And Enlist Duo is, I'm really excited to have Enlist soybeans come to Western Canada to provide that control, ease of control of canola in soybeans to make sure again, that those rotations truly are uh, canola free to minimize spore load increase. So that's it for club root. Oh, I don't know, Debbie, was there anything, questions now for club root or should I continue? I think you're still on. Chad, so far, so far, no questions on the, uh, on club root, integrated pest management around club root. Okay, so black leg. This one slide on blackleg. We forward breed with foundational multigenic blackleg resistance. So right from the time we make a cross, we look at the uh, the resistance that the that plant has or that line will have to blackleg resistance. And what that does is it it allows infection in the leaf, but it the plant fights it along the way. Multigenic just means multi genes, many genes involved um, through the development of that pathogen through the leaf down into the stem to make the canker. And so you can see some infections in this level with a, uh, that multigenic black leg resistance. You can see usually this area, depending on your level of tolerance. Very seldom do you ever get a 100% clean plant. But the key to that then is the durability of it and knowing that it's going to be robust across environments. We also now, though, are taking the approach of layering in single gene seedling resistance to stop that plant from even getting infected. And so that can give you this kind of scenario that's 100% clean. But the important part here is to make sure that we continue to do the first bullet point and we don't let off on that at all. Because as a grower, you're not sure necessarily what virulence genes you might have in your field unless you've done testing and so you might think you're doing something really good and getting a, a single gene seedling resistance deployed on your farm but if that virulence gene is present it's going to quickly overcome that resistance mechanism of that single gene 
And so you could, if you don't have this background resistance, this multigenic black leg resistance, you could quickly go from a scenario that we have on the, on the left picture to the one on the right. And that's not what we want to have our products doing at all. So if you do have, that is your scenario, you might go from having that picture that's on the left to going up here to having something that's starting to get minimal infection. It might be showing up if you go out and start cutting stems um, during, during swathing or, or close to harvest at maturity. You might start to see some infection in the stem, but you won't notice a yield penalty at all. So it's that, you know, making sure that we're, we're using those single genes to increase the robustness, but again, having that strong foundational resistance package as well. And sclerotinia, this is another one that's, that's kind of uh, exciting. We've worked on this for a number of years. I remember when I was in 2003 going down to uh, North Dakota State University to look at plots they were growing for us down there as well. And these pictures of 45S52 um, were, and 45H29 were taken actually just outside of Rosebank. And you can see 45S52, which is a, a resistance, a sclerotinia resistant product, has some infection. It's still getting some, but it's upper canopy, it's branches, uh, it's occurring sometimes later on. And this plot was actually right beside it, 45H29. And you can see main stem infection, complete girdling, and there's going to be a lot more yield uh, reduction within that. And so we have deployed a number of different sources. One of the more recent ones, 45CS40, was layered with uh, clubroot. One of the ones that's really exciting that I'm excited to see um, this summer in the field and see the data from this fall is our, one of our most recent launches, which is P505, uh, which has uh, club root, sclerotinia, and now has the Harvest Max trait in it as well. And so we're starting to get combinations of these traits, and it's R rated for black leg as well. So completely resistant, or it's resistant to black leg. So these are, you know, we're starting to layer all these uh, traits into single packages, which growers, I know, and growers have been asking us uh, for this for a number of years. It's not an easy task, but we're starting to get to the point where we're able to combine a lot of these traits into single packages to really drive, again, getting closer to this 52 bushel an acre average that the Canola Council is asking us to get to. Harvest Max. So this trait we started working on, uh, I believe it was 2009, we built a, a machine to help us uh, quantify some of our, our resistance mechanisms or our, our ability to differentiate our genetics for tolerance. And you can see here early on, uh, this was from a number of years ago, we were having tolerance versus ones that were quite susceptible. And 46M34 was our first deployment. Um, and you can see it there in the picture compared to 45H29. And that's the key, right, is that with Harvest Max and the harvest management that comes along with this through either uh, late swathing or straight cutting, right, you get that increased protection um, as compared to these products that aren't labeled with the Harvest Max trait. And so we've a number of deployments, uh, the, the, some of the more recent ones, uh, 45 CM39 and Vermont 3010 uh, have the Harvest Max trait, uh, and they actually have the differential club root source as well. Um, one of the more recent launches that we have had, it'll be P506 ML as well. So again, I know there's been a, a dramatic shift in straight cut acres, and we want to be able to make sure that we are uh, kind of protecting growers, reducing that risk with this Harvest Max trait. And this is another question we, I got asked quite a bit last summer, last fall, last winter. How do we do our ratings? And so this picture on the, on the far left uh, and the mid center picture from our, one of our screening nurseries in Carmen. And you can see these plants in rows that are, that are either shattering out. And the one in the center, you can see this very center row that has very little shatter at all as compared to its neighbors. This is fairly early screening early generation screening. And once it starts to get identified through this mechanism, we then move on to late harvest 
experiments. And so we have a number of these across all three provinces in which we'll go out, we'll harvest the same material at a normal timing, and then we'll leave the other stuff out there. I think this one was actually harvested. It, this was Alberta. I think it might have been harvested in early November was when this one was finally harvested last fall. And you can see in the picture this plot that it has shattering. Again, this one straight head that has some shattering and then these two here that have quite a bit less. And so you go in and you can take these shatter scores, which we have, but then you also get the yield data from these plots and you can tell any, if there's any yield reduction from these. And I think that's an important piece to this is we got, it's all about yield in the end, right? We wanna make sure, we wanna increase yield overall across every acre that we put products on. And that's our, that's our intent. So just because this one didn't shatter as much, it still needs to out yield uh, these other products in the field as well. So moving on from harvest max to fertility management, this is an area to be completely honest, we're not working as much in as maybe we could be. Nitrogen use efficiency and phosphorus use efficiency um, there is some research being done. I spent, uh, I did quite a bit of my master's work looking at roots. This was an image I actually collected from a canola root early on. It was at the two or three leaf stage. Uh, and it has been shown in a number of other crops, there's a strong influence on roots, just in terms of length, in terms of angle, in terms of uh, their access, their ability to access nitrogen or phosphorus. So it is an area that maybe we need to spend a little bit more time looking at. And I think in terms of the Canola Council, the other piece would be timing of applications as well, making sure that crop has the, the nutrients it needs and when it needs them. And so this is an area of, of continued study. It's something we're gonna start looking into more next year. We're gonna start doing some plots uh, that will have some variable rate uh, and different uh, fertility practices, but it's it's something we need, we haven't spent as much time on and we need to spend more on. Within Corteva though, we do have the Entrench uh, and NSERV nitrogen stabilizer products, uh, which I think again goes back to that for making sure that the crop has the, the, the fertility and the, the access to the nutrients when it needs them. Plant establishment. This is one that links straight back to that Harvest Max slide that I you look at the, the very center pictures, uh, the two differences between helix and the lumiderm helix pictures that I have. Having a very well-established uniform crop come out of the ground really strong in the spring is a key part to that harvest management piece as well. You wanna be able to go out and you want that, harp, that crop to mature at the same stage. You want it to come in and you want to have a tight knit right across the, right across the whole field. And so cold and frost establishment is something that we've been working on for a number of years. We're gonna to continue to work on. I just had a, number, a few meetings recently on this. And you can see there's two pieces. There's cold, so that's essentially early growth and that early vigor piece that we are working on. And I think we've made great gains in that. That tied along with our seed treatments has really, I've been really happy with how our products have responded uh, in these last two springs in terms of out of the ground and their ability to compete and kind of grow at a pace in which, you know, if they, they do sometimes need to get to, you know, there's that issue of uh, flea beetle feeding, right? And so to try to outgrow and, and outpace those flea beetles and the, the amount of feeding that they're doing. The other piece, the more, I would say, more complex piece that we're working on, and this is right back again to that reducing risk, is frost. And we are working on it, and you can see from this picture on the left-hand side, where this, this was a screen in which the plants got exposed to a, a minus six, and the ones on the left-hand side were ones that we've been kind of developing and working towards that frost tolerance, and the ones on the right-hand side were the controls. And you can see, we are making gains in this space, and this is really exciting. Uh, it's a little more, uh, it's quite a bit deeper in our pipeline. Uh, I wouldn't expect to see it in a frost tolerance in a commercial bag anytime. 
uh, within the next year or two, but it is something we're continuing to work on. And I think it would really go a long way in terms of uh, reducing risk and simplifying management for growers. And one of the final, um, this is back to the, the final pieces around the big bucket area that the Canola Council has identified around, uh, and they have eight bushels an acre of genetic improvements. And so this is historical U.S. corn grain yields. And so you might be wondering why, uh, why a canola guy is showing corn grain yields. And I came across this this past winter and thought it was a really, it's a striking example of what uh, the growers in the U.S. have been able to achieve over the last number of years with corn yields. And you can see going back to the 1860s um, to you know 1930s, there was essentially no gain made in corn yields in the U.S. Then they started using double cross hybrids. Um, I would suspect nitrogen uh, fertilizers were used quite a bit more in this first uh, kind of bump up from 37 to 55. And then you get into single cross hybrids. And again, the use of uh, fertility and different management practices has really continued to drive uh, corn genetic gains um, at about two bushels in the, in the most recent years, from 1996 to 2011. They've been getting about two bushels an acre on average per year with an obvious outlier of the drought in 2012. And so I thought when I came across this, I thought it was really interesting to look at that historical trends. And so I went and created something similar, uh, maybe a little less refined for canola. So I went to the Canola, of Council, the canola Council of Canada's website where they post average yields uh, across years. And I broke it out. So the blue on the far left hand side, so you have years across the bottom and, and yield up the side. And so you have our, what back when we were predominantly open pollinated canola, we were getting essentially no genetic gain. There was really no, no increases from 86 to 95 in average yields. And so I started, I broke it at 96 to 2007. And the reason I did that is during that time, 95 was really when we started herbicide tolerance, started to come to the marketplace for canola, as well as hybrids were starting to be deployed into the market. So you have a bit of a confounding effect of both of these factors going on during this period from 96 to 2007. And you can see there was really good genetic gain. We were getting about half a bushel a year of genetic gain. Still some fairly big swings, uh, 2002, was quite low. 2005, we had a, a really great year. And then I took um, the, the last step here, this 2007 to 2018, I took that as a cutoff and said, okay, in 2007, we were well over 90% of the acres having herbicide tolerance. And we're well over that for hybrids as well. So what has been our gains for those last number of years? And we're up to almost, um, 0.9 bushels an acre yield gain year over year when, when looking at it across all those years. And that's really exciting, especially when you consider, so if you compare that to corn's two bushels, you can say, well, we're not as good as corn, uh, but then you compare the energy per acre. Uh, if you go back to that value per acre, canola, the amount of energy stored in canola seed as oil uh, is, you know, that oil versus starch comparison, you're getting a lot more energy from that oil than you are the starch. And so that, to me, that's really exciting and shows that in Western Canada, as an industry, as growers, um, as researchers, we've done an excellent job in really ramping up and becoming competitive with canola. And I'm really excited to, to see this. And you can see again, 2012, again, an outlier a year down at the bottom. Um, for drought as well in Canada. This is one of the last slides. So how are we gonna get there? What are some of the next steps? So this, that was the last chart was what we've done, what we've delivered through growers and companies and as an industry. And so as a company, one of the pieces, one of the new breeding methodologies we have deployed is predictions. It sounds a little out there, 
we want to be able to do more for the same amount of money. Right? Our, our, our funds in research are limited. And so we want to be able to do more with the same amount of dollars and that will increase our, our genetic gain. And so how are we doing that? Well, to get the genetics of a canola line or a canola product, canola inbred, is relatively cheap. The cost of that has gone down dramatically over the years, which has been which is really great. That technology has just you know exploded. Phenotyping, on the other hand, has consistently stayed expensive. It you know you have to you don't have to tell growers that that going to try to grow a crop is expensive. And so when we're trying to grow these plots and collect all this data, that is expensive. So we want to make sure that we're leveraging all this phenotypic information. So what we know about it, it's lodging, it's maturity, it's plant height, the shatter, everything. And we want to exploit that through our knowledge of the genetics that are associated with it. And then what we can do is we can put more material into the top and essentially throw away the garbage with the use of these predictions. And as these get better and better, and it's been proven in corn, uh, they have commercial products in the marketplace now delivered through this, uh, some of these scenarios of early the use of early predictions. And what it does is it allows us to stack the deck in our favor early on. And so if you think of, think of it playing poker, if you're allowed to only deal yourself a hand with the face cards, you're a lot more likely to get a better hand in the end. And that's what these genetic predictions are allowing us to do. And you can see here, early generations, when we have huge numbers of lines to screen, we're relying heavily on genetic information. Near the end, when we have a lot more um, products to look at, we're relying predominantly on phenotype or actually looking at these products in the field and making sure that we get them distributed widely across Western Canada and every farm to make sure that we know how they're gonna respond when they do get out into the environment. And so we can do this with a number of different traits, right? Just leveraging these associations. So this is, I'm really excited to see this. It's relatively new into the game. Uh, with this, uh, when I say relatively new, uh, about six years. And so in, in research terms, that's relatively new. And I'm really excited what we're gonna be able to deliver in the next six years, given that we have been using this uh, and leveraging this technology for the past six years. So. I think we can get there with uh, with the Canola Council suggesting that they need they want eight bushels of an acre out of uh, genetic improvements. So to conclude, again, this is back to the same slide. Um, we're hopefully you had to take away that we're working towards sustainability and profitability through the reducing reducing of risk, increasing of value, and the simplifying of management. So with that, I'll stop there. I think plenty of time if there are questions or not to have a have a quick discussion. Okay, well thank you, Chad. Uh, so far we don't have any questions um, in the uh, chat room. So I'll just give everyone a, a minute or two to think about what questions they may have. But this is very exciting. You know, with, with the Corteva, we were, we were breeding for you know, many, many different sources of clubber resistance. Uh, right now we have uh, CR1 through CR3 club root hybrids available in the market. So CR1, CR2, CR3. Um, if, I, if I recall correctly, Chad, be in the next two to five years, we will have up to CR7, so lots of different options for our customers to, um, to manage their club roots and to prevent, and, uh, you know, prevent club roots or deal with club roots that they may or may not may have on their farm. And then with our black... I some, that, that I saw, yeah, I just saw some recent data actually this morning from our, our screening of this year, and so, yeah, the... Uh, the uh, response that we're getting out of these new genetics in terms of club root resistance is really exciting. Um, we're going to have, yeah, we're going to have a number of different sources available for, for growers um, to be able to, to mitigate that risk, right? And make sure that we, we keep canola profitable. 
So one of the questions that just came up on the uh, on the chat is thinking of a grower, how a grower might, what a grower might ask is with talk of rotation for clubwort resistance, how do I know what I am rotating to? So we do post what pathotypes uh, we are resistant to. Right? And so one of the, the, the ways in which you could potentially look is just look at the different response to uh, what pathotypes that there are resistance to. Like I said, there's the 3H, 3A, uh, and a few different ones. So I would suggest talking to your, to your seed reps um, or, or retailers and asking them that question. Um, because they do have that information on which ones are different. So, and, and another, so that in combination, uh, yes, you know, Chad, the uh, all of our all of our uh, representatives and our retailers that we uh, that we sell through all have access to that information. But a lot of that information is also in our product guide, um, which is on our websites, both brevon.ca and uh, pioneer.ca. So a grower has multiple avenues to figure out what, um, what he's rotating to. Okay. Yeah, and a lot of the stuff I talked about in terms of club root is available on the website as well, Debbie, right, in terms of club root. So. Correct, yeah. Okay. Um, another question is, how do I determine what is present in my field? Which pathotype is present? So you can send that away. I'm not the best person to be asking um, that. But your provincial, uh, your provincial representatives would know um, where to send those. There are a few different labs where you can send things away to get them tested. I think there might be a bit of a backlog. We're still, I think, um, if because I know if every grower wanted to start testing that and figuring that out, that would be a big challenge. Um, and if I, I. I Similar to, and I'd like to think that that would go away, that challenge, but I, I don't, I think it might, as club root expands across acres, it might become a, a bigger challenge maybe even, but hopefully we can solve that. I know it's still a challenge even when it comes to black leg for growers. Like I mentioned, growers maybe want to shift seedling resistance genes in black leg, for example, but unless you know what's in your soil, it, it's tough to know. And that's why I said, we want to make sure that we're layering on that foundational foundational resistance for black leg as well for growers. So club root being newer, there, there's going to be more options, but I would suggest right now, yeah, talk to your other, I know some of the agronomists or seed retailers would have more information on that. And I, you know, working with the agronomists and the seed retailers, I think we are, they are all equipped to um, identify whether or not uh, you have club root in your field but I believe they're all recommending that you connect with your uh, provincial um, provincial authorities to do the appropriate testing yeah. to actually I figure guess, out which pathotype. Yeah, and just to follow up to that too, uh, I listened to a researcher from AFC, uh, an expert on club root talk, and his one of his recommendations was your best probe is when you plant hundreds of thousands and millions of seeds in the field. And so if you're growing, a, like I said, the, the, the first and foremost is to get a club root resistant product out there and deployed because the predominant pathotype is, uh, is 3H. And so you put it out, put those um, resistant genetics out there and then watch and look and pay careful close attention because they will, because club root is so patchy and so spotty in a field, that that is probably your best mechanism to find. And, and if you don't find anything, you don't find any patches, wonderful. Uh, if you do find a patch, you know what resistance genetics you have and, and you might have to deploy something different. So. And, and so Chad, another, another question is what symptoms, I think you had a picture, you might wanna go back to one of your, but what symptoms should I watch for in my field? For club root. Yes. Here, sorry, I got There you are. Yeah. So, again, if you the the key piece to this, and again, like I said, that research put it well. 
all every plant that you seed is a pro looking for clover. It's, uh, so if you notice anything that looks different, that looks like it might be dying, get off, pull it up, check is it club root, is it black leg, is it sclerotinia, what's causing this plant or this patch to dry, die prematurely? Um, because that's that's a key, those, those, that's key information to have. And, and the quicker you can get it, uh, the better, right? And, and by quicker, I mean years, right? not necessarily weeks, but years. If you can get it the, the, the first year that uh, and on, a, on a few plants or a small patch, it's a lot better than, than larger patches. So. Chad, one question that I often get uh, when I'm out uh, uh, chatting with growers and, uh, and retailers is, you know, if I, if I'm planting clover resistant hybrid, am I, am I sacrificing my yield? Cause yield is, you know, critical to me. Yep. Like what, what's your thoughts on that? So when we deployed 45, I go back and I, the, when we deployed 45 H 29, we moved that product through the pipeline quickly because we saw a need in Alberta for growers to have to have a clover resistant product. And our goal as a company was at that time was to position that product around uh, that Edmonton region. But we, I, again, I mentioned our testing pattern is throughout Western Canada during our, during our uh, evaluation period prior to registration. And the response from the commercial teams were every, was everybody wanted that product. And the reason they all wanted the product was because it yielded because it, 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 was, it was the best yielding product uh, out there that we had, and it had club root resistant genetics. And so it was a bit of a, uh, there was, some, I know some challenges that, that first year and that most of the supply went to, to one region because of club root and some of the other regions were a little disappointed because they didn't get the top yielding product. And so no, in terms of our genetics and our deployment of uh, club root resistant products, we have seen no yield penalty or yield lag at all with the deployment of these genetics. If anything, it's been, uh, with our first experience, it was kind of the opposite. So. Um, one, one last thing, and it's, it, there's no question in the chat, but I was very interested in your uh, cold and frost tolerance uh, slide. Now, one of the things when I've, again, when I've been out talking with uh, with uh, growers um, in the field, you know, when we have so many cool springs and, you know, long springs like we had this year, um, there's lots of talk about, uh, you know, hopefully we have an open fall, right? So how, how far away, like how do you, are, in our current hybrids and the hybrids that we're coming, how do, you, how do we rate in this cold and frost tolerance and how far away do you think we are in having something you would say is really cold and frost tolerant. Yeah, so in terms of the last, so the last two springs, like I said, I've been really happy with how we've performed in terms of vigor and growth. And part of that's genetics. And I do have to give kudos to our crop protection team as well, because a lot of it's been uh, seed treatments as well, that combination of the two. Uh, and the frost piece is, is going to be a challenge. It's going to be a little trickier but it is something we are working on and so one of the pieces we're gonna we like i said we just had some meetings on one of the other pieces we need to start deploying and we have access to is, is a lot of uh, remote sensing or drone data that we can get these this early growth and that early growth ground cover and that uniformity on and we can get we can move from that subjective rating score of you know a one through nine or whatever to actually having hard data based on uh, images and so I think in terms of that, that cold emergence and that vigor will, will continue to drive that forward. Uh, and for me, it's, it's about maintaining what we have now in our products, because I think we're, we're very competitive in terms of that out of the ground vigor, uh, continuing to drive it forward. And then this, this, like I said, this frost piece is a little further out, but if we can continue to work on it, we'll get there eventually. Okay. All right, well, uh, folks, we have three minutes left. I think I'm gonna wrap the call right now. Um, if there's any other questions, uh, feel free to uh, 
reach out to either myself or Chad um, through the Corteva website. You can find us. Um, you know, some very exciting things coming in the, with the with Corteva uh, with the Corteva canola portfolio. Uh, you know, it's very exciting to see that. You know, our research team they're looking you know not only to solve problems today, but into the future for you know for our for the growers in Western Canada. So we're trying to anticipate needs. And we always look forward to um, communication from our customers and, and to find out what's really, you know, driving them and what they see in the future. So thanks, Chad. Thanks for leading the Canola team um, and thinking further ahead than what most of us think these days. And, uh, you know, it's great job. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for attending today. Yes, thank you, Corteva, for participating in Egg and Motion Discovery Plus. Now we encourage you guys all to go check out um, the Corteva exhibitor booth and learn more about what Corteva has to offer. So thank you, everybody. Um, I think we all can say that we learned something. So have a great rest of your guys' day exploring Egg and Motion Discovery Plus. Thank you.